Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so this is the third lecture of our AAPI lecture series. The whole lecture series feature four AAPI scholars and activists, and uh, the whole lecture series are meant to draw attention to AAPI history through the lens of race, immigration, culture, and activism, and also AAPI community's contribution to shaping American society. Um, so for today, uh, Huang Qian Lao uh, will give um, a lecture titled The Brief History of Chinese Americans. So Huang Qian Lao is affiliated with historical records of Chinese Americans known as Mei Hua Shi Ji. Um, she is also affiliated with um, Chinese American History Foundation of New York. She also serves as a host and the narration writer of the series of History of Chinese Americans at Cinevision.com. So now please uh, welcome Huang Qian Lao Shi to give her presentation and talk entitled Brief History of Chinese Americans. Thank you. Huang Qian Lao Shi, please share Thank your you. screen. Thank you for having me here. So let me share my screen. All right. So do you see my screen? Yes, yes. Perfect. OK, OK. Thank you for having me here. For the next 45 minutes, I will be talking about the brief history of Chinese Americans. Then we will have questions. I will be talking about, these are talking points. Old China trade, building the transcontinental railroads. Number three, the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Four, number four, 62 years under the Chinese Exclusion Act. Number five, the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act. Number six, anti-Asian hate. Okay, a couple of years ago, I found a headstone in downtown Boston. There is a cemetery. And this, this man was buried in 1798, just 22 years after the US independence. His name is Cho. He was 19 years old when he fell down from ship mast at Boston Harbor in 1798. He was buried by his captain, John Boyd Jr. John Boyd and his cousins, together with Captain Robert Gray, discovered the Columbia River. And because their ship, their family ship is named as Columbia Red Viva, that's why they named the, the river after their ship. They took auto first to China from the Northeast coast, then brought back tea porcelain to Boston. And this is the first ship to circumnavigate the globe. So this period of commerce is called Old China Trade. This is his headstone, and this is his master, John Boyd Jr. And in the middle, you will see the ship this, uh, which discovered the Columbia River. Okay, but actually, the first sail the first ship who went to China, which started the Old China trade is called China Empress. Old China trade was initiated by the China Empress sailing to China in, in 1784, just a couple of months after the US independence, which was six months after the establishment of the United States. And the next year, another ship named Napalas brought three Chinese. You can see their name here. So this is the earliest record. This is a, the record of the first three Chinese arriving to United States. So we can see actually before the immigration to the west to the west coast, like uh, in the two years after the establishment of U United States, uh, there are already already Chinese sailors on the east coast. And why they have to go to China? Because tea was so important to colonial America. British introduced tea from China to colonial America. 
and become a British controlled overseas trade until American independence. Then American independence started all China trade between US and China. As you can see on the left, this is Boston Tea Party. So the, the tea boxes were dumped into sea. They are Chinese, they're tea from China. Also when George Washington, George Washington rewarded when he was fighting with British and he, they could not pay cash to his officers and George Washington rewarded his officers with tea from China. So you, so you can see how important, how important tea from China is. And also when the ships brought back merchants from China, George Washington himself bought a lot of porcelains from China and also John Adams, and he bought China teacup too. Here you have, you, you can see there's a, this teacup was in auction, but this was uh, from John Adams. And also here you see the silk sample from China. On the right, on the right, you see the, this is a business record from kept in Harvard Business School. And this is her family's opium trade record. Wait, okay. So in the beginning, American merchant brought tea, a silk back, and they brought uh, like fur from north or Northwest mm -hmm. to China. But very soon American merchants followed the British to smuggle opium into China because the opium sale was very, very profitable. And uh, since British controlled the production and the warehouse in India, Americans had to go to Turkey to ship, to ship opium to China. And these are the numbers. These are the statistics provided by the Peabody Access Museum in Salem, Massachusetts. This is how much opium was shipped into China. And this is a flyer from, China, from Chinese government, anti-opium poster. You can see it in the beginning from, okay, looking at the, from the left on the top, this is a one pain. Okay, this used to be a good family, people working. Then, because but the husband, young man, started to use opium, and that would create a problem. Then he stopped working, and the family has to uh, sell their stuff. Even they have to sell their furniture. At the end, this man becomes so sick, and his wife, his daughter, has to work. Then he died. The professor, a uh, Harvard professor, John Fairbank is a specialist in Chinese history. His word is, he said, the opium trade was the most long continued systemic international crime of modern times. And opium trade profits shaped the 19th century Boston. A lot of college hospitals, uh, like other or uh, insurance company, even bank got a lot of money from opium trade. And uh, Columbia University, let's take this look at Columbia University Memorial Library. The president, uh, okay, the president says Lowe inherited a fortune in 1904. And uh, then that's the year his father passed away. And his father was a opium merchant in China. And this uh, Mr. Says Lowe was the president of Columbia University then he built Columbia University Law Memorial Library in 1905 to commemorate his father. And later he became New York City mayor. See, this is the library. And also the, the credo of, United, of the American Industrial Revolution is in law textile mills. But this, the, all the three investors of this mill are investors of China trade. And this uh, on the left side, this museum is still open. Right in the beginning, I went to there, I see their exhibition, and they said clearly all the three investors uh, made their fortune in the China trade. And also the, the first donor of the, of the Princeton University, John Cleve Green, he made his fortune in China trade too, mostly opium. And uh, America had, uh, uh, at that time, America already had um, very, a big interest in porcelain. 
Even today, White House has a China room, which kept the porcelain from every single president, from President George Washington and the President John Adams. Okay, now let's talk about gold rush. So actually before the gold rush, Chinese sailors already arrived with American, sail, uh, American merchant ship to the, to the East Coast. But the, the major, the immigration, Chinese immigration started in California. When the gold rush, when the gold was discovered in 1848, Chinese were among the miners who arrived from all, all over the world, among the miners who arrived from all over the world. So, but let's look at the one case so you can see how the Chinese were treated. This case is called People versus Hall. And this, there is an article in California Supreme Court Historical Society magazine. This article tell us how brother and their friends killed a Chinese miner in the armed robbery. They were guilty in the first trial, but the, but the, but the lawyer went to appeal. Their lawyer said, according to California law, Chinese has no rights to testify in court against whites. Why? This is a California law said, held that the words Indian Negro, Blacks, and the White are generic t terms designating race that therefore Chinese and all other people not white are included in the prohibition from being witness against whites. So that means Indians, Black people, and Chinese people cannot testify in court against any white man. So also the, the court document also say Chinese are a race of people who, whom nature has marked as inferior and who are incapable of progress or intellectual development beyond a certain point. And their history has shown differing in language, opinions, colors, and the physical confirmation between whom and ourselves nature has placed an impassable difference. For these reasons, we are of opinion that the, that the testimony was in the, admissible. That means whatever Chinese said, the court can take it. So they said these murders for, for free. They said these murders free. So that was a, a case during the gold rush. That was 1854. This case is called People versus Hall. Okay, now let's look at the railroad. The first transcontinental railroad was completed in 1868. But actually America had dreamed about this for 20 years through a couple of presidents. But two reasons Lincoln decided on to build this railroad. Number one, gold was already discovered 10 years ago. America needed to speed up moving people to the West in order to develop West. Number two, Southern states wanted to become independent from America in order to keep slaves. You see on the left, all these red states, Texas, Arkansas, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, Georgia, these are the, these, these states want to keep slaves. So, but the North, but the government didn't want them to keep uh, to keep slaves, so they want to become independent. So Lincoln was very worried about it. But at this time, the governor of California wrote to Lincoln, supporting his idea to build a railroad to connect West Coast to the East Coast. And he said, once the railroad is built, I can send the natural resources to help you. So Lincoln was determined to build a railroad to connect west coast to the east coast. Then the Congress passed two laws in 1862. Number one is, but these two laws are, are connected. Homestead Act is granting this law just give up to 160 acres of land for each male adult in family. If you can continue to work on it for five years. 
Uh, but in order to move people, people have to get there, need, need to get there first. But how to make people get there, Lincoln need a railroad. So the Congress passed a railroad act to build transcontinental railroad. Okay, this picture, what you're looking at is Lincoln personally went to the, the end of the current railroad, which is in Iowa, Council Bluffs. Lincoln and, and the General Dodge were looking at the map, trying to figure out a route from the current railroad to the west. So this is how he, this is how he, how important this railroad is. Lincoln was personally look at this. And why bring laborers from China? Because there was a shortage of laborers due to the civil war. And also it was very hard for immigrants from Europe to go to California. And it's easier to bring Chinese to the West Coast. Also a railroad worker is a very tough job. You have to sleep outside and you cannot go home for, for long, long, long time. And uh, also it's very dangerous. So there, uh, there, it was a big shortage. So at that time, this is a uh, Chinese workers built like 15 tunnels on the Nevada mountain. And uh, these are all granite. At, at that time, you have only hand tools or explosive to use. But at that time, explosives are now stable and that was a very dangerous job. You see, this one is a trestle. So at that time, you, they have to build a lot of trestles to go over these valley. And Chinese workers were assigned to the most dangerous sections. You see this uh, on the picture, you see this yellow house. This is uh, where you mix the, the explosives. And in the middle, you see this, this man is Chinese. And all these, you see these uh, houses on the, on the mountain. And here you see in the middle, this is entrance of a tunnel. The train would, would go into here. And you see the horses. And also the telegraph lines were set up in order to report daily construction progress to Washington, DC. Lincoln had given 14 years to finish this railroad. It was completed only seven years, in seven years. Lincoln, unfortunately, Lincoln died before the railroad completion. And what you see here is uh, at the 50th anniversary celebration of the completion of this railroad, they brought back three Chinese workers to parade. Now we have the transcontinental railroad. It takes only eight days from New York to California instead of navigation for several months. Before you have to go, if you want to go to New York from, from New York to West Coast, you had to either take the ship, either go to Panama, then, then walk, then uh, not, not walk, you have to go through Panama, then take the ship again north to California, or you go over all the way around to the, to the Chile, Ar Argentina, then again, go north. Either way, you, you know, it, it's gonna be take couple of months and very dangerous. Even the engineer, the chief engineer of this, ra th this railroad, he died in the traveling. And just the railroad was completed in 1896, right? Just one year later, one year later, US Congress was talking about giving the the uh, naturali naturalization rights to Blacks and Chinese. What happened is 13 amendments freed slaves. 14 uh, amendments granted citizenship to African descendants. Now, at, at this time, 1870, 1870, the Congress were talking about passing 15 uh, amendments granting the voting rights to African-Americans. Massachusetts Senator said, the right to naturalization should not be denied on the basis of race. He means everybody, American Indians, Blacks, and Chinese should all have the right to vote. However, the Nevada Senator William Stewart 
the man, the man on the right, this man, this, he is a William Stewart, Nevada senator. He launched a filibuster to go against it. He was strongly against Chinese getting voting rights. See, just one year after the completion of the railroad, the Congress denies the voting rights to the Chinese. And here, what we see here in front of us is a voting ticket of that time. It says, no Negro or Chinese suffrage. That means, okay, during the, like, during the starting 1860, 65, 66, 67, 68, there was a debate in, the, in, in America about if America should let black people have the right to vote or have the Chinese, or let the Chinese have the right to vote. So many people say, no, no Chinese or, Chi or, or Negro suffrage. They don't want black people to vote. They don't want Chinese to vote. But however, in the Congress debate, people did give black people the vote to write. However, Chinese, this race were denied. Then we will, we will come back to this. You will see what happened when Chinese people doesn't have right to vote, what happened to us. Now let's see, continue to look at the railroad. So when the railroad was completed in 1870, right? That was the only railroad on the west of Mississippi. Although the East Coast has, has a very, is a complete network of railroads. You can take railroad ed, anywhere, but this was the only one. The most difficult section was done by Chinese, was completed by Chinese. You, you mean this section is Nevada, Sierra Nevada. And the Sierra Nevada is all within California, not in Nevada. And people, Chinese people drilled 15 tunnels to go over. And let's see what, let's see railroad map 10 years later. 10 years later, this is a map of, Uni of the railroad in the United States. So many railroads were getting built up to connect to this trans transcontinental railroad. So people can go to, from here, people can go to East. Another, let's say 20 years later, three transcontinental continental railroad was built. Northern transcontinental county road from, from Seattle to Minnesota to Luz. Another one is Southern, Transcontinental Railroad from San Francisco to New Orleans. And because of, you see the, the, the change of the railroad, the speed of building railroad on the west, on, on, the, on the west side of the Mississippi, just 20 years later of the first continental, transcontinental railroad, US Census Superintendent formally announced that the country's frontier had been settled. So can you imagine if there's no, the, if there's a, if Chinese did not build a railroad in seven, in seven years. So that's why there's a picture says, we built the railroad and the railroad built America. So this one summarizes the importance of this first transcontinental railroad and the role that Chinese played. And not only the West Coast, not only the, the railroad, after Alaska become part of America, Chinese were also pioneers there in mining, in salmon industry, and in services like cooking and the laundry. This one, this picture is a bakery owner in Alaska. At, at that time, uh, the cans, salmon can industry was uh, like very good technology or something very new. They were in Oregon and they are also in Alaska. So this is a drawing of Chinese of the Chinese workers in can, salmon can industry. Again, salmon can industry is very hard. You have to stand in the pick the pick the, the fish, very smelly, dirty. You're in like blood and scale. It's it's a, it's a tough job. Many people don't want to take it. Also, when U.S. Navy after the Alaska, U.S. also want to go to do the Arctic Explorer. So in 1879, U.S. Navy sent the Arctic ex expedition to look for a path to reach the North Pole. So in 
So this is a picture. They had shipwreck there. And there was three Chinese there too. And uh, this picture from this picture, these are the survivors. On the left, this one, this is a Chinese Chinese soldier, Charles Tongxing. And all of them got a medal. And this one is medal, is Tongxing's medal. You can see his name here, Charles Tongxing. This was given by the US Congress. Another, and all the others perished in, in Arctic. Some were drowned, and some were per some perished by hunger and the cold. Okay, now let's go to number three, the Chinese Exclusion Act. How did the US start to install this Chinese Exclusion Act if the principle of this country is all men are created equal? Let's see, only four years after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, Chinese became scapegoats of economic recession. The most popular slogan in California, in all the West Coast was the Chinese must go. You see, this is flyer and this is a magazine cover in Oregon. California Working Men's Party, there was a working, there are two working men's party. One is California Working Men's Party. And this party's objective is against Chinese immigrants. So there is a, a so they can find a party, they can build a party whose sole goal is to drive Chinese out of the country. Then some politicians took advantage of this sentiment. Let me give you one example. This is a main Senator, James Blaine. He was a three time presidential candidate. And he was the one who was working with Lincoln to abolish slavery because he believed just like Lincoln that all men are created equal. So that's why you can't have slaves. However, when he wanted to run for president, he took Chinese. Okay, now he forgot about why. Because remember, we, we talk, that's why I, I talk about in 1870, they denied the voting right to Chinese because Chinese cannot, have, cannot vote. That's why he take Chinese. So one famous, one famous cartoonist he saw this and he drew this cartoon to demonstrate who uh, Blaine's true intention. is sitting on the cornerstone of our republic, which is equal rights to all men. Okay, this is Chinese. His ticket say no votes, cheap labor, industrious. And on the other side, it says dear labor. A vote. I mean, other vote, other laborers have a vote. So they're dear labor. And Chinese has no vote. So that's why Blaine, James Blaine, can kick out Chinese. So this is a many, this is typical the politicians were using this uh, anti-Chinese sentiment for their own political campaign. Okay, uh, by the way, this uh, creator of this uh, cartoon is Thomas Nest. He is the most famous cartoonist in the US history. He was the one who created American version of Santa Claus and also the symbol for Democrat party and for the Republican party, which is uh, elephant. Well, another one is a uh, donkey. Uh, they are all created by Thomas Nest. And why he was doing this, look at the political map in 1880. At that time, Republican had, Republican party had North and the Democrat party controlled South of United States and the West was new. So both party want to get the votes from the West coast. At that time, Oregon and California together combined, they have eight electorates. These are swing states. So that's why the both party candidates want to go, want to take it on Chinese. They want to take Chinese issue to win the 
votes from union. Same here, you can see red on Republican and this blue is South, but whoever was running for federal office, they want to win the votes from California and Oregon. That's why they want to take Chinese. Give you another example. O'Donnell was running for the San Francisco mayor and his campaign promise is within 24 hours of my election, I will deport all the Chinese, put all the Chinese on boat, send them back to China. So that's why on his ticket, he says he was the first who started the ball rolling and kept it rolling. And he was he has perseverance against Chinese. And what he wants to do is Chinese exclusion. So they use this anti-Chinese sentiment to win the votes. And let's look at another cartoon. The title here on the bottom, it says, says, give it to him. He has got no votes nor no friends. This is the 1880 political cartoon. And they say, when politicians do agree, their unanimity is wonderful because both, that means both parties, candidates work against Chinese. They all agree to let Ch to install Chinese exclusion. So everybody was beating up on Chinese. Rem why? Because Chinese were de denied the voting rights. So no party ha can have our vote. So we were useless. So the Chinese exclusion was passed in 1882. So two years ago, there was a presidential election. So the both party candidates were using that moment to win votes. So even in the in 1880 election, even the October surprise was about Chinese labor. So one party's candidate forged a letter accusing his opponent want to hire Chinese. So this way he can smear the other party. So get himself elected, right? So as a consequence of this kind of rhetoric, 40 hour, 48 hours before the voting in, 80, in 1880, an anti-Chinese riot broke out in Denver, Colorado. And the, in the same year, this is a magazine's cover. These are the two parties candidates, Garfield and Han, uh, Hancock. These are, okay. They're both, they're both nailing down a Chinese because it says, where, platform, where both platform agree, no vote, no use to either party. And two years later, the Chinese exclusion passed Congress. And that was a celebration. This man is the draft. Uh, he drafted this Chinese exclusion. He is Senator, California Senator. And following the passage of Chinese Exclusion Act, the violence against Chinese lasted more than 20 years in the Northeast area. Rock Spring Massacre. Rock Spring, okay, this is in Wyoming, in the mining area. This is a mining, mining camp of the, for the Transcontinental Railroad. At least eight, 28 Chinese miners were killed and 15 were wounded. And these are the, the, the Chinese consulate send people and brought their lawyer to the to the to the mine. And this here you can see the picture, historical picture. And this lawyer was on the Chinese side, Frederick V. And in 18 the three years and uh, five years after the Chinese passing of the Chinese exclusion, in Seattle and Tacoma, uh, they had a Chinese expulsion from Tacoma and Seattle. And they, 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 they drag Chinese, put them, put them on ship, let them go and burn down all their houses. They don't want them to come back. And recently they had apology. And also I'm very grateful and proud of a friend of mine who is a, a associate press journalist. He discovered a massacre of 34 Chinese miners at Hell's Canyon and published in a book. And this is, and he worked out 
to put a monument in the site where Chinese were killed. And here we, say, we see how the, they got helicopter, helicopter to bring this monument into the valley because that was the only way to transport the, 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 this monument into there. And uh, this is his book. And then you see him, this is the, this young man, and he was interviewing president on airplane. Okay, next, let me tell you some heroes who stand up for Chinese, stand up on racial justice. This, this one, like uh, we said, Thomas Nest, he is cartoonist and he used his pen to speak out, to argue for China, to defend Chinese, right? Okay, he draw, first he draw this one, it's called Pacific Chivalry. On the back, this is a court of justice. It says court of justice closed to Chinese, extra taxes to yellow jacks, means Chinese have to pay extra taxes. And this is how they, they are treated. Uh, this is how Chinese were treated. They can throw stones and beat up you anytime for no reason. And here is, uh, you, you see all these uh, other people, this other uh, European immigrant chasing down Chinese. And this in the middle, you see Colombia, and he was, she was defending Chinese. This is Thomas Nest. Another hero is uh, Frederick Douglass and he is civil rights movement leader. When he was young, he was a slave and he studied, uh, he relied on himself to become a leader. And uh, he was the first one who defended Chinese in 1968. Many people say Chinese uh, cannot assimilate to American culture. That's why we should not have him here. We should not have him, uh, have Chinese here. We should not let them uh, have the vote to have the right to vote. But he said opposite. I have said that the Chinese will come, and have given some reasons why we met, my, why we made, why we may expect them in a very large number, in no very distant future. Do you ask if I favor such immigration? I answer I would. Would you have them naturalized? and have them invested with all the rights of American citizenship, I would. Would you allow them to vote? I would. Would you allow them to hold office? I would. This is Frederick Douglass. He said a lot of things about Chinese. Douglass said the 15th amendment, we, we just said before, there's three, 13, uh, 13 amendment give uh, freed, freed uh, African slaves, and the, and the 14th uh, Amendment give uh, citizenship to African slaves, African American slaves. And uh, 14, the 15th gives the voting rights. And Douglas said, the 15th Amendment seemed to shield me as hide of the rhinoceros, but Chinese did not have this shield because Chinese did not have the voting rights. But, but this is how, Douglas see how important the voting right is. It's like a shield, it's like a hide. It's like, it shield me as hide of a rhino. And other Chinese people also spoke out against this injustice. This is a student, a Chicago University Medical School student. And he said, this country is the land of liberty for men of all nations, except Chinese. I consider it as an insult to us Chinese to call on us to contribute toward building in this land, a pedestal for a statue of liberty. Because he received a paper asking Chinese to donate for the uh, liberty statue, uh, for the pedestal to, to build the pedestal, pedestal of, uh, for the liberty. And he says that statue represents liberty holding a torch which lights the passage of those of all nations who came into this country. But are the Chinese allowed to come? As for the Chinese who are here, are they allowed to enjoy liberty as men of all other nations, of all other nationalities enjoy it? Are they allowed to go about 
everywhere free from insults, attacks, and injuries from which men of other nationalities are free? That's a very good question. And he also said, if there are, because Chinese as there are two, there are two, uh, there are two, regular two things that prohibit Chinese uh, freedom. Number one is Chinese labor cannot come to United States. Number two is the Chinese who are already here cannot become US citizens, only Chinese. That's why if you cannot become US citizen, you see what happens. This man was Columbia Law School student, excellent. But he can never become a lawyer because he is Chinese. Because in order to become a lawyer or become a doctor, first you have to be an American citizen. Because he is Chinese, he was born Chinese. Regardless, you know, regardless how excellent that you are, you can never be an American. So you cannot be a lawyer. Same thing happens to a doctor. I have another doctor's picture. I didn't, I don't have it here, but I, I just tell you is that is uh, it's the same thing. And he, let me see, liberty, okay. And also, let me see, let me, this, uh, because we, we talk about how politicians use this anti-Chinese sentiment as their campaign platform. And there is a man activist named Garrison who pointed out, he said, this is how he talked about how the politicians made up excuses to justify the Chinese exclusion. But he pointed out actually all these uh, all these ex uh, all these excuses are just lies. Let's see his point. Number one, these politicians say uh, Chinese are unable to assimilate into American society. And Garrison said, if the Chinese had the right to vote and could participate meaningfully in elections, they would naturally assimilate into American society. There is only one method of getting people to assimilate, treat them with respect and see them as brothers. The Chinese are peaceful, hardworking and patient. We must give them equal rights and treat them sincerely. Otherwise we have no right to blame them for being clannish. And also this is a New York clergyman Henry Beach, in response to the alleged inability of the Chinese to assimilate into American society, Beach said, we attack the Chinese with sticks and stones. We burned their homes and killed their people. Yet they still do not believe in our religion. We want to show them heaven. So we have to send them there with explosives. This is what Beach said. Okay, another objection from Garrison. Some politicians say, uh, this is the not number two excuse, the Chinese send their money home to China. Garrison said, is there anything wrong with sending money back home? If so, why does no one have a problem with the Irish and the German who do the same thing? The Chinese send back in thousands dollars and thousand dollars, while the Irish and Germans send back in millions. The Swiss, Irish, and other people come to America exclusively to send money to those back home, to those back home. Around Christmas, just one German steamboat carries over $1.1 million to Germany. Loving your family and respecting your parents are virtues that should be lauded. Those who cast blame upon others who cherish their family bring disgrace upon themselves. To send a tribute and love to old and far, far away homes is a beautiful thing. 
whether the money is received on the banks of the Canton River or on the River Lee, that means ri River Lee. It is a little, little, River Lido. It is a beautiful expression of human nature. Also, some politicians say Chinese compete with American labor. Garrison said, at the same time, America desperately needed labor. So the Chinese came. They did not come to take the jobs from American workers. I remember how needed Chinese works were when construction began on the North Pacific Railroad 20 years ago. In Oregon, I heard the foreman talking about how difficult it was to find enough workers. So Chinese feel out of work, uh, labor shortage, not here to compete with anyone. Okay, excuse number four and the objection from Garrison. They don't spend money and they're too frugal. This is Chinese, this is our, this is our crime, okay? We're too frugal, we don't spend money. Garrison said, Garrison said, being frugal is a virtue in New England. Our historians like to refer to the noble character that arises out of hard times. Didn't our great men come from those times? The industry titans of Standard Oil Company and the steel industry spent lavishly, yet Lincoln's contribution to the nation greatly surpasses them. If being frugal is a crime, Lincoln should have been deported. This is a Garrison's word. Okay, Garrison also said the Forbes, Forbes, Russells, and the Cunningham, they are opium dealers, opium smugglers in China. Here, you see this picture? This is how, this is, a, this is done by a British uh, oil pen, painter. This is the, the big sail ships arrive in China, but they don't go to land, but they go to a small island called Lintin Island. This is like, um, um, like a storage place. They will put the opium here and ask Chinese smuggler, ask Chinese people to use small boat to sail them, to send them to China. So this is a description of how the opium smuggler was, was working. And this is a Forbes picture. This picture is Forbes. Garrison said the Forbes, Russell, and the Cunningham families all made illicit fortunes of opium in China, yet they took the money back to America to invest. Do we call them immoral or doing so? For doing so? So nobody, nobody blamed these opium smugglers in making, making illicit fortunes from China, from opium trade in China and bring back to invest in America. But the politicians do blame Chinese who send their money back to their poor parents. Okay, excuse number five, an objection. The Chinese live in crowded, dirty dwellings. Garrison said, who is to blame for this? The oppressed obviously need to stick together. They share common habits and a common language. Other races have all done the same thing until eventually learning to mingle under the sunlight of freedom. However, the sunlight of American freedom has never shone up on the Chinese and they have no choice but to congre uh, congregate in crowded, unclean quarters because our prejudice prevents them from improving their livelihood. And we have to specially talk about this uh, senator, this great, great man senator. In 1902, Congress was uh, voting to make Chinese exclusion law permanent. Out of, seven, there were only 77 votes. 76 voted yes. They want Chinese exclusion, exclusion law become permanent. Out of this 77, only one man stand up for justice. This is a Mr. George Hall from Massachusetts. And all his lifetime, he every time he voted no to the Chinese exclusion. So he is our hero. So even today, Chinese community still remember him. 
every even till during the pandemic, we still do we still do memorial day for him. Oh, it's a picture. Okay. And also, let's see. Okay, remember, let's go. Remember, we talked about in 17, 7, uh, 1870, Nevada, Nevada Senator William Stewart were uh, were against giving Chinese people the voting rights. Okay. Now, when the Chinese exclusion job become permanent, he was so happy. He was congratulating 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 himself for being so visionary in denying the voting right to Chinese, so the Chinese exclusion law can be successful. This is what he said: If they had been allowed to be naturalized and become voters, they is Chinese. Okay, there probably never would have been any exclusion but there would have been great trouble. See, our freedom would be a tr trouble to him. So this is uh, Nevada Senator William Stewart. Uh, this is uh, the, the senator that we were talking about, this senator who voted always no to Chinese exclusion. Even today, the Chinese community still held a memorial every year for him. Uh, Wilson Lee set up a ward in Senator name. The man holding a flag, he's my friend. And uh, the woman next to him is the president of New England, the Chinese American Historical Society president. And this uh, woman brought two of his kids to know about this history. And also another another senator uh, from, from Maine, and he was also the vice president for Lincoln. He is also a hero. He said he voted no against Chinese exclusion. He said, I shall vote against this measure and I leave that vote, the last legacy to my children that they may esteem it the brightest act of my life. This is Senator Hannibal Hamlin. And also this uh, another senator from Massachusetts with one, he said with one, this is how he went against Chinese exclusion. With one exception, the tests imposed were suggested against those seeking the hospitality of our shores have been standards of character, education and the property, not racial. We have drawn the race line only against one nationality. In other cases, we admit the people and exclude the individuals. In the Chinese case, we admit the individuals and exclude the people. And also the Chinese exclusion, there's another clause that if you are Chinese, but you are in the United States, you have to wear a special ID that is only for Chinese. And if you, if you don't have it with you, a policeman caught you, they can immediately deport you. And this, uh, the Illinois, Illinois congressman went against this. Never before in a free country was there such a system of tagging a man like a dog to be caught by the police and exam. And if this, if, and if his tag or color is not all right, taken to the pound or drawn or drowned or shot, never before was it applied by a free people to a human being with the exception of the sad days of slavery. Okay, we finished about the Chinese exclusion era. Now let's talk about how the Chinese exclusion was repealed. After Pearl Harbor, US and China become war allies. So, before that, Chinese had been described as stupid, low class, dishonest, and unhygienic. Now media depict Chinese as honest, likable, intelligent, and possess an ancient civilization. And this is from a World War II documentary about China. This is from the army. It has a long history 
a vast territory, a large population, rich raw materials, loves peace, and has never launched an overseas war of aggression in its history. A Pearl Buck is daughter of American missionaries in China, and he, she was a leader in advocating the repeal of Chinese excluded, excluded. She was married to a New York publisher. So she has a circle. So they organized a lobby team to talk to the politicians. Pearl Buck even went to Congress hearing for the repeal of Chinese exclusion. So this is do, during the break, the Chinese people were there to greet him, to, uh, to thank her. And they also published the, put the, this advertisement to advocate for the repeal of the Chinese exclusion. Then President and also the Japanese army in China was using Chinese exclusion law as a propaganda against America. They don't want Chinese to trust America. They say you cannot be, they cannot be your friends. They even don't let you go to your country and they only made their law to your people. So don't trust them. So Roosevelt heard about it. So he urged the Congress repeal Chinese Exclusion Act as a war aid. Roosevelt said, I regard nations like individuals make mistakes. We must be big enough to acknowledge our mistakes of the past and to, and to correct them. By the repeal of the Chinese exclusion laws, we can correct a historic mistake and silence the distorted Japanese propaganda. And also some people were scared if you let Chinese in, it will, come, it, it will have competition to Americans. He said, would certainly not cause unemployment in this country or provide any measurable competition in American search for job. Because even the Chinese exclusion law was repealed, there was a national quota by which only one year, only 105 Chinese, including men, women, children, uh, whatever age, senior can come in. How can a hundred people quota affect America's job market? And these 100, 105 people can include senior kids, women. I regard this legislation, he said, as important in the cause of winning the war and uh, we, and of establishing a secure peace, commenting that it would also silence the distorted Japanese propaganda. That's how Roosevelt convinced the Congress to repeal. Also during the, the in many Chinese Americans joined the army in the World War II. As a result of civil rights movement of the 60s, US Congress passed the Equal Rights Act in 1964. And how does this affect Chinese people? Like, like, let me give you one example. This book is about racial segregation. So these two girls were kicked out of school on the second day by the principal because they are not Caucasians. The parents filed lawsuit, but they lost lawsuit because the law allows school to do this. But after this uh, equal rights, after this equal rights, they cannot do the, they, they, cannot, they, they cannot have this racial segregation. Also another act that was passed as a consequence of civil rights movement is the Immigration Act. So this one will allow more Asian immigrants to come to US. So we have a chart here. See so starting the, this new law, you have a new, you have a, Chinese immigration rights. Okay, now we come to the Chinese American today. I, I wonder how many of this you, you know. This is Congresswoman Judy Chu. This is a physicist, nuclear physicist. This is architect Pei Yuming. And this is Maya Lin, the architect, a famous architect of the, war, uh, of the Vietnam War Memorial in DC. Okay, this is, let's come to the last part, is anti-Asian hate. 
this is during anti-Asian hate. Chinese people and all, all other uh, Asian people stand up. Uh, let me talk about one person that I know. Oh, actually, I know her, her grandparents. I know her grandparents. This is uh, Ava. First, let me tell you, anti-Asian hate, after you, we learned this history, we can see the anti-Asian hate is an extension of a long history. Ava was a second year Harvard student when she saw the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans. Ava was deeply hurt and she felt terror and anger. Ava created nine drawings to tell her family history of six generations in America. She said, by telling our stories, we can change our future because we have to face that racist history. Um, let me give, take one page in eight from Ava's drawing. In 1887, an arson fire destroyed Chinatown in San Jose, California. Ava's ancestors lost home and livelihood. So this was historical pic uh, picture, history, historical picture of the San Jose Chinatown fire. A professor, Minnesota University professor, Eric Lee went to Congress hearing on the anti-Asian hate. She wrote a couple of books on the history of Chinese, of Asian Americans. This is what he said. This is what she said on the anti-Asian hate crimes. They are an expression of our country's long history of systemic racism targeting Asian Americans and the Pacific Islanders. This history is not often taught in our schools. In order to make a change, we first have to face our history. Okay. Professor Yu, Ying, I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you so much, Huang Laoshi. Thank you so much for such rich and important talk. Um, and especially for showing us all the vivid images and original documents. Um, I, I think uh, um, it's very, it's heartbreaking for me to see some images and hear stories, but as you summarized at the end, in order to change um, our society and to make our society more just and equitable, we need to learn more about our history. Um, that's very important. Thank you so much, Huang Lao Shi, for the wonderful uh, my talk. My pleasure. Thank you okay. for having me. Okay, now the floor is open for question and discussion. Uh, so you can either uh, raise your hand and ask, uh, mute, unmute yourself and ask the questions by yourself, or you can type your questions on chat. Um, so Huang Lao Shi, I think I saw uh, two questions okay. uh, in chat. They all ask you to share your PowerPoint. Yes. Sure, sure. I, I, will, I will save it as PDF because it's smaller, it's easier to circulate. I will save it. I will send it to you right after this. Okay. Okay. Uh, so and then uh, Huang Lao Shi will send the PPT to me. And then I will send yeah. the share the PPT with Xia Lao Shi. Yeah. And then Xia Xia Ming Lao Shi then can share the PPT with um the our Chinese school teachers. Thank you so much. And Thank Wu you. Pi, Wu Pi, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, uh, uh, Wang Lao Shi. Uh, yeah. Thank you for um, the presentation of yes, about yeah. the history of the ch uh, Chinese American, Asian American. Um, I, I, it struck me that the similar history happened. I think it's uh, uh, all over the world, and for particular because I, I was Indonesian. Um, I lived. We lived in Indonesia before. Oh. I remember you talked about the, the 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 tag part that Chinese had to carry on certain identifications. Yes, you were tagged for so oh. many years, for so so many decades, for 30, uh, 35 years um, before um, they changed the system. But there was like a certain number associated in, in our ID card to to mark that, and we could not also participate in a lot of other things. We could not be like a 
civil servant work for the government, uh, run for office or that sort of thing. So similar um, experience that the Chinese American experience in the earlier, earlier um, century. Thank you so much. It's very um, enlightening. Oh, so, so, thank you. Can you tell me for that, that was in Indonesia? Yes, in Indonesia. For, for who? You have to wear tax. For Chinese. For, for Chinese, Chinese right? descendants, right. For Chinese oh. descendants, all Chinese descendants, um, we, our ID card is numbered differently. So uh, even though we said we are, you know, we're, we're Indonesian, we could not, um, you know, we were born and raised there for generations, but even though we, uh, it doesn't matter the fact, um, we, were, we, we were still tagged. You, I, thank you for sharing. I actually, I have a friend, a very good friend who lives in California, retired. He came from Indonesia. He's a Chinese, uh, he came to America like at age like 16 or for high school age. Okay. And, Exactly. He knows. He he told he told me about this. this is part of history. That's why he was very active in political arena, because he knows how important to have a political power, to have a political voice. That's why he dedicated all his life. Ever since he came here, he he came here at age like high school age. He, his parents mm -hmm. sent him to come to U.S. Like, because of better racial equality, and he always kept active in elections, have want to have a political voice because he knows exactly, he knows what you just told us in what, what they suffered in, in Indonesia. Thank you for sharing. I will tell my friend tonight. He will You're be very, very happy. welcome. You're very welcome. Yes, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, uh, I see this, the similar histories uh, play out for Chinese. It doesn't really matter where they are. They're always uh, where we are you, uh, because I'm also a Chinese descent. We always yeah. get, to be minorities wherever we are. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much. Are, are you, you a student? You. Are you a student? I am, uh, I'm a staff here. I'm the administrative coordinator for- Oh, okay. Yes. Thank um, you, thank you for sharing. I, I hope more people in the United yeah. States, uh, more yeah. minorities hear about this. Yeah. And thank let, let's do something, like get uh, engaged politically, have a power, have a voice. Yes, it's. It, I'm sorry, I'm putting on my hood because uh, our heat went out. Um, oh, the, the that's okay. Super cold. Um, oh. So, to a pleasure meeting you here. Uh, oh, thank you. Technology. Thank you. Thank you uh, for sharing. Yeah, yes, um, it's. I mean, it's very important to to have uh, uh, representations um, in government because one policy can change the life of the the whole the entire population. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We, we see that from we see that from today's you know history pr presentation. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Have have a wonderful evening. You too. Thank you. Uh, Upi is my colleague at the College of Worcester. She has attended all the API lectures. Wow, Upi, fantastic. Thank you so much thank for you, your yeah. strong support. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, uh, so please email me. I, I shared, I just shared my email address in chat. So please email me at zyu at worcester.edu if you need the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I see so, Cheryl Nunes. Yes, Cherry Nunes. I even speak some Spanish, yes. so I'm familiar with your last name, <laughs> Nunes. It's, it's uh, by, by virtue of marriage to someone of Puerto oh. Rican oh heritage. But I want to thank you for um, for this history. It it's a new lens on our American history. Number one. Two, I appreciate the emphasis on celebrating heroes because in every generation, we forget there are heroes. We forget about models for how to be humane. And three, I am, um, I, I'd like to just point out what is probably the obvious, but in critical race theory, you know, that people are, are really coming under fire for that. But one of the points uh, these theorists make is that many of the, um, of our governments and of structural moves towards quote unquote inclusion 
and equality are done in the interest of the white majority. And I think in the examples you've provided, that can't be more true. And so we have to, um, I think, continuously define interests that are collective and not just accrue to one group, which is the white Absolutely. majority. Absolutely agree. We have to see, see, also when we talk about the contributions, when we talk about who built this country, many times the colored people's contribution are forgotten. People yeah. forgot the, the, <laughs> the entire economy of South was built on the back of, of black people, right? So, and so this today was a labor acknowledgement. And I propose that as we convene and we give honor uh, to place and to people, we give labor acknowledgements that continue to surface these truths because these are also the shoulders on which I stand. Wonderful, exactly. Thank you. You're, Thank you. you're speaking to my heart. Thank you so much, <laughs> Cheryl. Cheryl, are you a, are you a staff? You can be a student. Yes, I'm a staff person at the college. I'm the uh, probably one of the newest employees, the vice president for equity, inclusion, and diversity. Oh, wonderful. No, wonderful. Thank you so much. I hope You're next right. time I was to attend your, your meeting, you should be, well, a, you should be a talker. You should be a speaker. I wanted to ask if you know uh, 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 Renee Tajima. Oh, I know, you know, I know, I talk to her, I talk to her all the time. CLA. Yes, yes. Renee is my classmate from college. Wonderful, where, where did you go to class together? Where did you go to college together? Harvard, we were at Harvard together. Oh my God, fantastic. We, we, we should have a, a webinar, just listen to you to talk. We Cheryl. should, where she spearheaded Malcolm X weekend, by the way, you see okay. we're all in the same coalition. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy to meet you here. Thank you for your work. Oh, thank you. Sherry, thank you so much for being here. Sherry is the our new vice president of diversity. Yeah, diversity, equality, and inclusion. Yeah, thank right. you so much for your strong thank support. Thank you for <laughs> doing this. It's we need to do it every day. This is an act of true uh, liberation. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much no, for your support. Uh, Cheryl, yeah. do you know? By the way, do you know we have? I'm in New York City, and we our mayor is Eric Adams. You, you know, I'm his volunteer. I have been volunteer for him half year, full time. Cheryl, and I met him a couple of times. Cheryl, please unmute yourself. Okay. Sorry. No, so that's amazing. Um, yeah. I had a classmate who also ran against him in that race. So, but, <laughs> but you know, things are changing. And the point is that um, as we move spaces, forget about teaching spaces, we have to remember our shared history, yes. you know? And so yes. this is really important because our involved. Yes, yes, thank you. You Thank you all so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to see our vice president <laughs> here. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Huang Lao Shi, I saw so Liu Liu Yangfan. Liu Yangfan, are you still here with us? Would you like to share your comments or suggestions? Uh so Liu Yangfan from Sparta Zhongwen uh, Chinese schools, uh right wrote a wonderful talk. Thanks. Sorry, so few people attend. Um, yes, I think this week is crazy at my college. I know my own students have homework due by Friday. Uh, and also it's a crazy time. Uh, and also uh, Liu Yangfan 
wrote brought my personal child for this and he enjoyed it. yes thank you so much i would share the video to my chinese school students assuming cseus will post it on youtube um we actually so i'm recording this and uploaded it to the iCloud, the Zoom iCloud. Then I will share the link with the Vice President Xiaoming, and the Xiaoming will share the link to the recording on Zoom with all the teachers. Um, so yes, definitely you will get the link. It's the link from the Teams, uh, from the Zoom. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, I was kind of trying to put the kids to bed. Um, yes, uh, so first, uh, thank you, Hong Tian Lashi, because I, I missed your talk at our annual meeting. I, I was so regret for that. Uh, it was overlapping with my talk, but it's a great pleasure to hear your talk again today. And uh, it, it's, it's well, right? Because in Chinese school, we have a lot of heritage learners. They try to learn the language. They claim they want to know their own culture, everything. And the teachers was, I understand the teacher was like, okay, I'm, I'm no experience. I need more support. I don't know what to say to my kids. I think it's an important topic. But also at the same time, when you really, like I actually posted the flyer in our school group. I'm so sorry to see nobody really attends. Um, it's hard. I mean, people are busy, I understand and all this stuff, but I just really think we need a lot of uh, advocate for that. Um, it's I, I i i don't know i have a mixed feeling here i mean i'm so proud of you guys for your work but at the same time it feels like we are trying to push the like other states we are trying to push the uh asian history into the public school curriculum system but at the same time it's like come on even our own asian kids doesn't really pay attention to this resource what's the point you're forcing other non-asian kids to listen to this if you don't even interested in it like I mean, sure, we call it our history as our America, but you have to admit this part is more close to us. So we at least should have to do start from ourselves, start from our own kids. Um, I'll try my best, but I just feel so sorry uh, about the current situation we see. Yep, thank you. Great job, you guys. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, Liu Lao. I yes, I think Xia Lao and I we advertised the event. We also did some marketing, but I think we can do more. <laughs> we can do more to uh, advertise the event. But I think later I will do more to share the links to the recordings so that more audiences will have access to the recordings. Yeah, because like this month, the March is like the uh, African American month, and all the school are talking about it. I find wonderful books for kids to read, and I can barely find any book for kids, especially even if I find a a piece sound well. Like I, I think so far my favorite is the awesome uh, American uh, Chinese Asian American. They have a book about uh, about twenty um, people who made this part of the made themselves famous in history. Most of them, to be honest, I didn't hear them before. And not talking about this kind of systematic issues. I'm so grateful that we can got a quick look at this within one hour. Have it, at least have a big picture, not talking about all these details, but you have a general idea. That's very precious opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Uh, sure, I, I'm sorry, I'm really <laughs> poor. I just, my pronouncing surely right but yes no it's pressure cheryl so i'm cheryl. just thinking perhaps you know as a, my team is my team is is striving to put together a web set of web pages that can really um aggregate this kind of content as a toolkit and so uh do we have permission to add this uh, as, as a resource for anyone who would like to view it in the future. And we can kind of curate and direct people to things like this. So Huang Lao Shi, uh, would you love to give, a, yes, give us yeah, sure, permission to sure. share the links? Sure, sure, absolutely, yes. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> yes. so we Thank you get, so much. We of will course. get the recording from you and yes. um, so it doesn't matter how many people attend it tonight. 
Yeah. What matters is that history recorded. Yes. It was done. And now it's for us to continue to share it. So if that will happen. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Huang Lao Shi. Oh, then, thank you. Uh, yeah, after the, the conversations, I will widely share the links, the links to today's recordings. And also, yeah. after I get the PowerPoint from you, the PPT from you, I will also okay. share the PowerPoint widely. Uh, I think Zhang Ying Lao Shi, I think you have a question. Uh, would you like to ask your question, Zhang Ying Lao Shi? Zhang Ming ba? Uh, Zhang Ying. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, I'm not a teacher, but I just a oh. a uh, 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 a mom of a kid. So I want to. I would like to say wow. if you can share a list, a book list of a uh, okay. Uh, have sure. a the micro history uh, that kids can read because because I know the school uh, currently do not teach those materials. But for at least before I um came to your presentation, I. I just know very like broad view of that, not much details, and it's also a good education for my kids and also for myself. So sure, sure. Yeah, yeah I will definitely, you. I will definitely send a link to to you. Okay, Mom. thank you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so Professor Mark Chang, so much. Thank you so much for being here. Do you have any questions, Professor Mark Chang? Please unmute yeah. yourself. Hi. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, I mean, I, I wanted to say um, that that was a, uh, a really fascinating talk. And um, I think that uh, it brought up um, so many important issues. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I learned some things from it. So, so that was great. Um, uh, I noticed that the, at the end, um, you, you know, you're talking very quickly about the sort of recent episodes of um, anti-Asian hate. And um, I know that this is, you know, of course, this has been a major issue uh, across the country. And so I, um, I, I don't know, I was wondering if you maybe wanted to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, how you kind of see that uh, fitting into this longer history of um, anti-Chinese um, discrimination that you that you talked about, and um, maybe how how you can kind of um, uh, you know what kind of perspective you do have on this now, um, looking at looking at it through that history. Okay, first as you you see these patterns, so whenever some politicians need to use this uh, sentiment, anti-Chinese sentiment. They just incite it. They just use it towards their own interest to help their own campaign. And many people, if they don't know the history, they trust these politicians. But when you see what politician did in the past, so you see a pattern. So if they immediately recognize, okay, what is your true intention be behind this finding inciting the hatred toward one ethnic group? When you are always smearing toward one group, there are good people and bad people, good behavior, bad people in every ethnic group, but you just focus targeting on one ethnic group to achieve your political agenda. If you know enough history, if history, if our history taught in school, talk showed enough this side of America. So people are educated, people keep their eyes open, people are careful for this kind of political agenda. So number one, number two is when it comes to the history of minorities, we have to know our school and our media and our publisher have to talk more about two sides. Of course, we have wonderful people who build America, but on the other side, you have to see it's not, you have to see the contribution from all ethnic groups. It's the, when we talk about all entrepreneurs, Oh, JP Morgan, uh, all, all these scientists, yes, but you have to see the laborers who are actually doing the dirty hard work. These people get low pay and these people should be remembered, should be, should be given credit too. So 
especially Asian, I, I'm glad to see the history of uh, Black, uh, Chinese, and uh, African Americans are being taught much more now. I'm, I'm very happy. I went to the Historical Society of New York, and I see a lot of history on African American, like civil rights book for kids, uh, Black Dolls. They use the Black Dolls to talk about history. Very good. The identity, the ethnic pride, very good. And I, I went to there to see an installation of the Fred Frederick Douglass and together with Chinese civil rights leaders. There's a strong connection. At that time, when Douglass spoke, argued for Chinese, defended Chinese rights, it encouraged so many Chinese. There is a Yale student and who, who fought for Chinese right too, but he, that he didn't have a strong, uh, uh, strong voice like Douglas. I got a paper said he exactly said, he said Douglas, Frederick Douglas has done enough good for his race. I want to do that today for my race. You see, that was 140 years ago. Douglas already in, inspired a Chinese student, the best student in Yale. So now this New York exhibit put Douglas and Chinese civil rights, rights leaders side by side. So we're on the same boat because we're all minorities. So when Martin, okay, so when we talk about Martin Luther King, I have a friend here. We, we, we talk about, okay, February is Black History Month. And I tell Chinese Chinese community, May is Asian American month. But forget, but don't celebrate only May because we have a lot of credit to give to the Black Heritage Month. It's Martin Luther King started all this. He stopped the racial segregation. He gave the equal right to all the ethnic groups. That's how the Asian people got it, right? So when we talk about the, our rights, the Asian, uh, the, the equal, the racial equality of Asian Americans are, 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 are connect, strongly are connected with the uh, racial equality of African Americans. So if no Martin Luther King, so we wouldn't have this immigration law. So we wouldn't have so many Asian uh, students, uh, Asian population in, in America. So we have to see this. So we have to see all the ethnic group uh, minorities are fighting for the same fight is racial equality. Like, uh, let me give you one example. The Eric Adams is African-American candidate for the mayor. When he started to run, there were a lot of um, um, uh, candidates for New York mayor. Now we didn't know who to pick, right? Although there are a couple there, all, uh, but you know, one thing, that convinced me to vote to support Eric Adams. When he was running, that was anti-Asian hate. A lot of, uh, and all other people didn't say anything. They pretend they don't see it, you know, because Chinese people didn't have my, many votes. They don't want to, uh, you know, say too much to Chinese. You know what I, Eric Adams did? He has good friends in Chinese community and the Chinese community told him about this. He organized a rally at his borough because he's borough president. And he brought all his staff, all the officers, the vice president of the borough, all the, as the, all the leaders, the councilmen, and they on the city hall council in, the, in front of Plaza, they had a rally and they brought all the media. He was strongly against this anti-Asian hate. You know what he said? He said, there was a law in this country that didn't allow your people to come. See, your ancestors built a railroad. They cannot even ride on it. He said, today you stand up. So you, that reminds me of the civil rights movement. You know how great he is. He thinks the people are here. He's comparing us today as civil rights movement. I was so touched. And he said, our fight is the same fight. Why? It's for racial equality. So that's why when we, okay, when, when, China, when Chinese people are fighting for racial equality, we have to remember this is racial equality for all the minority, ethnic minority, number one. Number two, the history of, a, of minority must be taught in school. That's why there's many states are, are, are setting up 
uh, legislations at state level to teach the, to add the Asian American history into a curriculum. In some states, they do combine. They they combine like in Nevada, they have the law is not for Asian Americans. The law is combined for Indian American, for African American, and for um, for the uh, Chinese um, uh, for Asian American for. African American for Native American for Asian Pacific American is one law. But in some states, because African American law are already part of the curriculum, so they made a separate law, like in Illinois, they, they made separate law just for Asian Americans. But because other uh, ethnic groups uh, history are already being taught are included. So, so this is we have to do something concrete to teach at all levels from very young to talk about the contribution. When we talk about this America, about this country, it's about representation. It's not only you have to be certain color to be American. Every look is American. Okay, we all build this country. So we're all Americans. So when the media is very, uh, media and the education, we have to include ethnic minorities as Americans, talk about our history, talk about our contribution. Let people know we are Americans, look, but we're Americans too. Uh, excellent. I think we can continue our conversation until very, very late, but uh, now it's 9.02. I know uh, everyone need to go to sleep. Yeah. So I would love to, um, like make announcement about our next lecture. So uh, next Thursday at 7.30 p.m., Professor Mark Chang will give uh, the final lecture of this lecture series entitled The Asian American Movement and the wow. Global 1960s. Wonderful, wonderful, um, wonderful. Yes, I think I really see the transition from Huang Lao's research and then to Professor Mark Chang's research. Then I see I the connections. <laughs> yeah, so I really look forward to Professor Mark Chang's talk next Thursday. Uh, again, Huang Lao, thank you so much for this br oh, thank brilliant you. Thank talk. Thank you for having me. And everyone, thank you so much for being here for all your wonderful feedback, questions, and suggestions. Wish you a good night. So for the College of Worcester audiences, I will share Huang Lao's PowerPoint and also the recordings uh, with you shortly. Uh, and also for the uh, for our friends from the Chinese schools, I will email everything to Xia Ming Lao Shi. Xia Ming Lao Shi, are you here with us? Um, and then probably, yes, okay. And then Xia Ming Lao Shi will share both the PowerPoint and also the recordings with everyone. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night and let's keep fighting. Bye-bye. <laughs>